This present salvation, on the other hand, this present salvation that we have received in Christ is incomplete as it is. The perfect salvation is yet to come. This inheritance transcends all fault. It's too intensely bright for our mortal vision. It belongs to another order. It cannot be revealed to knowledge until it is revealed in experience. Some of our present salvation will, in the future, be perfect. For example, our sins. Though the, infant, the mercy of God are already forgiven, and we may have the full assurance that there is forgiveness, but not until we are capable of a fuller knowledge of God shall we know the infinite blessings of the discovery that He has blotted out our sins as thick clouds which vanishes and leaves no stain on the blue skies. We cannot fully comprehend the forgiveness of our sin because we have not the knowledge so that when we enter into heaven, we're going to experience for the first time the blessedness of not having sin. We don't know how that feels because we're still encumbered by sin in our lives. It keeps us from doing what we really wish we could do and therefore we'll never understand how wonderful it's going to be until it's lifted. We get to we get a taste of the glory of God in our lives. We see the wonderful ways by His power <coughs> of the Spirit of God making our heart tremble with the, with the blend of reverence and joy. But in our mortal bodies, we could not stand them long because we could not contain the full blessings that God's got for us when we get to heaven. The day is going to come that sin is going to be removed from everything and we're going to experience the joy of all that God has and we can enjoy it. We, what we hope for is that in, in, in a life that appears so enlarged and with so divine an environment that these manifestations of the personal love of the eternal God for us we only hope for that day when we can move freely among them as we move in common air. The light of the common sun that will never become dim, never be incorrupt. But that in their tenderness and in their power, they will increase through ages after age and wonder after wonder. We'll never come to a point where we'll not wonder. After, after 20,000 years, let's say, we can't even comprehend 20,000 years, let's say after 100 years, we will continue to have the capacity to have increase in the joy of being in the presence of God. There is something in this great hope to give us courage and to renew the strength which too often faints and the resolution which too often fails. Knowing and understanding what we're going to experience in the future gives the present day some sense of okay. The joy of this Christian life would be immensely argumentative if, it, if we were dealt more constantly on his eternal completion in the divine presence. We have great memories to sustain us. And above all, the memory of that supreme manifestation of the divine love in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we place our thought on the of life and the death and the divine presence of God, that gives us joy. It's when our present salvation meets our complete salvation in our consciousness that we found God. 
every power of a better life receive new animation and we see that all things are possible to us. We are in the spring of our salvation. Dorothy may be in the fall of her, <laughs> her salvation. Some of you may be in the summer of your, of your salvation. Harvest time is coming. We'll reap the fullness, the perfect blessedness, the perfect righteousness of the saint in glory. Christ harvest home is yet to come. There is a song, Harvest Time. Love it, my mom sang that. We shall see for what great ends the Son of God became man and rose again for our joy. Joy should ring aloud in the believer's ear. Joy is a theme of Scripture. Let me give you a few tonight. Write them down, please. Psalms 4, 7. Psalms 5, 11. Psalms 9, 2. Psalms 13, 5. <clears throat> Psalm 16, 5 to 11. These are all Psalms. Psalm 17, 15. Psalms 19, 8. Psalms 32, 11. Psalms 33, 21. Psalms 35, 9. Psalms 36, 8. Psalms 40.16, the theme is there is to be joy in the life of the believer. Why then should a Christian ever be in strained faith? It's the duty of the Christian to be as rejoicing as he can possibly be. In reality, as I've said, not unto not until we, with our consciousness, with our conscious mind, get a grip, get a grip on this, can we experience this wonderful joy until you understand the doctrine of your inheritance, until your consciousness takes over and you sense what we have in Christ. It will supersede any suffering that you go through. Or too many of us do not rejoice. Paul had to tell his readers, Rejoice! I say again, rejoice! I remind you, it's what you put your focus on. You focus on all your trials. You focus on all your problems, and there are many. You focus on your health. You focus on everything that goes on around you, and it's not going to cause you to rejoice. You take your you take your focus off of that and put it on Christ. The focus of most people is earthly stuff. We spend most of our time focusing on stuff, and not on heavenly stuff. Let me give you several things to put on your thinking. Let me give you several things to put your thinking on. Here's, you, you should think on these things. Number one, a protected inheritance. A protected inheritance. You cannot lose your inheritance. As a believer, you cannot lose your inheritance. I've already talked about that. In this, you greatly rejoice, verse 6. Those things in verses 3 to 5, as we have already mentioned, it's our full and complete eternal salvation that we are to rejoice in. Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through verse 35. Look what it says. And I'll read it in another translation. 
you were willing to be a public spectacle, suffer reproach and tribulation. You were willing to joyfully have your property taken away. Why? Knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and abiding one. They can take your home away. They can take your car away. They can take your clothes away. Huh? But what they can't, Hebrews chapter 10, but what they can't take away is your inheritance. Don't throw away the towel, folks. Especially when you have a great reward. Don't, Hebrews 10.35, what does Hebrews 10.35 say? Huh? Hebrews 10.35. Don't allow earthly stuff to cause you to lose your rewards. You're not going to lose your inheritance. There's no way you can lose your inheritance because that's, that's your full salvation. But what you can lose is your rewards. Don't let somebody steal your rewards. Number two, a proven faith. Think of a proven faith. I've already talked about that. A theology of trouble. Let me give you a theology of trouble. Let me tell you, I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, five, six things on the theology of trouble. Here it is. I don't think I have it written down. Here, write it down. The theology of trouble. It does not last. It does not last. They're only temporary. It does not last. Even if you're married for 50 years, you may have lived your wife. Uh, I mean, your husband. Number two, it serves a purpose. The theology of trouble, it does not last. Number two, it serves a purpose. It serves a purpose. Number three, it brings pain. It brings pain. It's difficult. They are difficult to bear. So when you have trouble, it brings pain and it will be difficult. Number four, it is necessary. The verse says, if need be. If need be. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be, but if need be, it is necessary. Next, it comes in many forms. Trouble comes in many forms. And the last one is, well, no, next, it does not have to take away our joy. It doesn't have to to take away our joy. This is scripture, folks. It does not last. It serves a purpose. It brings pain. It is necessary. It comes in many forms, and it does not have to take away your joy.